Ladies and gentlemen and uh, dear friends, uh, we welcome you today. We thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Peter John Goulandris. I'm uh, honored to be chairman of the Academy of Political Science. And uh, this is the, uh, our inaugural uh, webinar and our first Academy Forum event and one that I hope that uh, with the uh, initiative of uh, Dr. Shapiro and the Academy and the SQ um, will be the first of many uh, talks, uh, interviews, debates, as, as the Academy uh, seeks to bring uh, to you um, the, the, the quality of political discourse and the examination of political institutions that you've come to expect of our institution. Uh, I, I, I will, I'll be brief, uh, but let me first uh, pay tribute to a great uh, friend and supporter of the Academy, and that is to uh, Professor James Carley. And as you may know, uh, Dr. Carley passed away uh, recently and he has been the heart and soul of the Academy and of PSQ for close to 25 years. And uh, everything we do is informed by his spirit, by his skill, by all that he's brought to us. Uh, we miss him greatly. And I'm sure many of you uh, uh, have known him over the years and known him well. And uh, uh, I would like to dedicate this inaugural uh, lecture uh, in his memory. And thank you very much. Um, excuse me. Uh, the, the, uh, let me say that we're, we have a, a terrific turnout today. And let me say that uh, you, our members, are uniquely valuable to us, that we, we, we value your support, your loyalty over the years, the interaction we have with you, your contributions to us, your contributions to our intellectual activity. Um, and, and that's why uh, this event is exclusively for our membership and, and uh, subsequent events also will, will always favor our members. So we thank you for that. And this will be yet another way that we bring to you um, uh, information and interaction at the, at the highest level. Um, you, you, you're, uh, I'm sure, familiar with Dr. Shapiro. Uh, he is the Wallace S. Sayre Professor of Government and Professor of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. He has received a Distinguished Columbia Faculty Award and the Outstanding Achievement Award of the New York chapter of the American Association for Public Opinion Research. He's an expert in American politics, public opinion and statistical methods. His research examines partisan polarization and ideological politics in the US as well as other topics concerned with public opinion and policy making. He's published numerous articles in major academic journals and co-authored or co-edited several books of importance. His talk today will focus on the state of American democracy and, and given all that's happening in the world and given all of the recent events and events to come, uh, this could not be a more appropriate uh, discussion, and we look forward to uh, to hearing what uh, Dr. Shapiro has to say. And I would say that this is very much in the mission of the Academy in terms of fostering dialogue at a time where, uh, 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 regrettably, uh, uh, dialogue on important issues of our day and dialogue on how we can move uh, society forward and, and improve people's lives has, has become, is, is almost absent from our, uh, from our public discourse. 
And, and it's all the more important that the Academy, with your help, with the help of our membership, uh, remain a beacon of uh, informed public discourse. And uh, in that, uh, with that, and thank you again for your attendance. Thank you on behalf of the board. And we have a number of board members that are also attending today. Uh, I turn the floor over to Dr. Shapiro. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Galandris. Uh, I wanna thank you for the very kind introduction. And I wanna thank our board members who are in attendance here tonight. Uh, this is sort of much appreciated to kick off this event. And I, I just wanna acknowledge a little bit further uh, the great loss we had when we lost uh, Professor Demetrius James, Jim Carroll, uh, who retired not long ago as the Academy president and the editor of Political Science Quarterly. Jim was, a, but was really an institution at the Academy, at PSQ, um, at Barnard College and Columbia University in, in political science and the School of International and Public Affairs. Uh, we, we very much miss him. Um, on a happier note, I'd like to introduce the Academy to, to everybody. Now the Academy is the institution and the journal and the things we do, but it's also the people at the Academy. And it's not a lot of people, but it's, it's a lot of great people. Uh, there's Mary Elena Mantis, who's the managing editor of Political Science Quarterly. Now, she really runs the operation of the, uh, of the journal. And there's Mariana Palumbo, who is our all-purpose research assistant for the Academy and for Political Science Quarterly, uh, whose work is greatly uh, appreciated. And then last but not least is uh, Lauren Morales-Cando, who really is the uh, uh, person who runs the show, so to speak. She's running the show tonight, but she runs the show that's the Academy as well. She's the um, um, Executive Vice President of the Academy and a, and a title um, well-deserved. Well so what I'd like to do next is I'd like to t tell you a little bit about the latest doings at the um, Academy. Um, as you know, based on mailings we've gotten from you and your votes, we have new bylaws, we have new board members. Hopefully this will energize us further um, it, it has energized us with the holding of this uh, second members only meeting. And as uh, Mr. Galandra said, we're hoping to hold more ideally on a quarterly basis. Uh, we would very much like to hear your ideas on topics of interest to you. We already know that there is a greater, great interest in topics in international, international affairs. Um, anyway, let us know about the topics and even about the format that you would, you would like. Um, and the slide in front of you is the slide in front of you is just a quick summary of what we're doing, the latest issue of the, of the journal, a nice mix of articles on international affairs and American politics, uh, the Academy's books, which are heavily on international affairs, even though we had one recently on the uh, candidate presidential selection process. Uh, and then most important have been the recent Academy events. Um, the last one was, was on a nation divided and, um, and polarized. Can we discuss solutions that, we, that we've held co-sponsored jointly with the, uh, uh, the, the National Network for uh, Responsible Public Policy. Uh, those, will con those sessions will continue on, on the third Thursday of every month. And we have upcoming sessions on the Electoral College. And also, I, I think the topic is judicial reasoning. It's on, it's on the courts, something a little, a little different for us. Um, and with that, I wanna move on to my brief talk on the state of American democracy because of the 2020 election and especially the insurrection attack on the Capitol on January 6th, 2021. Now, since, since you're here, I know you're thinking about this. So front and center, American democracy is under siege and we're no longer the beacon of light and enlightenment to the world if we had in fact been this up until recent events. These events have raised further questions also about what's often called American exceptionalism. All right, so is America, American democracy still intact? That's a big question. Our new president, Joe Biden, stated that American democracy has or will come out of the current crises stronger. And he's referring also to the pandemic and economic downturn. Well, Biden could be right. And to start, I wanna make the strong case for American democracy. But what has happened and is still happening is also stunning, frightening, and will require vigilance going forward. And I would also like to argue that there are comparisons with the Civil War that we should think, be thinking about, including one particular important one concerning the aftermath of the war that no, no one's been talking about lately, at least yet, but I wanna talk about. 
So American democracy, this is my assertion, American democracy is intact and strong. Now we have to define democracy here. Um, and we can define it fr from the Greek as Jim Carolay would, would constantly affirm, meaning the people rule. We, now we wanna focus here on what, what's called procedural democracy, that is process. And that's in contrast to what, what, what I would call substantive democracy, which speaks to the question of the extent to which government responds to or should respond to what the, uh, what the people want, what the public wants. I study public opinion and policy making and I do a lot of research on substantive democracy, but that's not what it, what's at issue here. What's at issue here as uh, more precisely procedural Republican democracy. A proce a Republican democracy since the United States is a democratic republic, it's in the Pledge of Allegiance, um, in which there are elected representatives representing the people. The people don't rule directly, they do so through representatives whom they elect. Now to start in this, in this regard and regarding normative requirements um, for democracy, which I'm gonna talk about below, I assert that democracy in America is intact and strong, um, or as others have phrased it, such as a political science quarterly board member, Tim Fry, uh, my colleague in political science, and also William Galston and Walter Russell Mead, uh, who basically have concluded Trump was too weak and American democracy was too strong. Now, the reasons are as follows. And many of you may have, have questions about what I, what I say here. And I'll simply say, I'm speaking for myself um, here as a... Uh, um, as a political scientist and a citizen. First, number one, the United States continues to have free and fair elections with, comp with competitive political parties. I should add very competitive political parties. Voter turnout hit a, hit a very high mark, even with, with a, a pandemic ravaging the nation. We had the largest numbers ever voting in the United States election. The votes were fairly counted and there was little debate about, over voter suppression. And as you know, voter suppression has been an issue. There was no, and I can't believe I'm, I have to say this, there, there, there was no foreign interference in the election has been feared. And the votes in the end were counted fully and accurately and a victor in the electoral college was determined. In short, as elections go, this was an extraordinary display of American democracy at the ballot box, and thus an occasion to be proud of. International observers praised the election, although the attention of international observers indicate there was some doubt. Two, American political institutions and its separation of powers remain strong. And we got to see this at all levels in the context of the American federal system. Federal system meaning that we're a federal, we're a republic of states constituting the federal system. The nation adhered to the rule of law, US constitution, civil service government officials at all levels did their jobs professionally and with great integrity, especially in running elections and county votes in an election in which voters participated by mail to a greater extent than ever. Um, as well as obviously, of course, in-person voting. Um, during the election, the election, I had to constantly tell my wife that that's the state election apparatuses for counting votes would behave responsibly due to their dominant norms and professionalism. And that was borne out. Three, the judiciary at all levels acted independently and fairly according to the law and upholding the rule of law. Now note how Trump lost his court challenges across the board in challenging challenging the election in key battleground states and in any appeals to the Republican appointee dominated federal judiciary, including the Supreme Court. Now the competitive states here I'm talking about were Georgia, Michigan, Wisconsin, Arizona, and Pennsylvania, which I guess we will, we will not forget for a while. I also told my wife during the election that the courts are partisan um, ideological it, and uh, are partisan and, ide and ideological in ways that affect issues like their, their, their rulings on issues like regulation, labor, civil rights, and social slash religious value issues, which are important to judges and, and, and judges personally and in terms of their legal philosophy, philosophies and their approaches to the law, as well as perhaps their own political beliefs. 
But they steer, what's important here is they steer clear of getting involved in elections and electoral politics. And they do not see themselves as beholden to the presidents who appoint them. So Trump and the Republicans you know, could expect reasonably favorable rulings on issue areas, on a variety of issue areas with, with which the judges care about, um, regulation, labor, um, social values kinds of issues, um, civil rights. There is genuinely a six to three conservative Supreme Court, or at least a five to four conservative court. court. Um, and it varies by, by particular kinds of cases. This, however, does not extend the six, six, three or five court, five, four court to the politics of elections where they will be most, where the judges will most likely adhere closely to the law as written to maintain the legitimacy of the court or where they will decline to make sharp rulings, if any at all. Think about it. Do you think that what Amy Coney Barrett and the other conservative justices on the court cared most about was keeping Donald Trump in the White House? They have power no matter who is president and who controls Congress, and they may have certain leanings judicially, but, that, but they can pursue those leanings without any particular president, president and without any particular party in control of Congress. That's what an independent judiciary is. Number four, now for students of comparative politics, this is, this is an obvious thing but uh, it's something we take for granted in the United States. The military and civil military relations remained in accordance with the law and norms of the United States in its history. As uh, Walter Russell Bede stated, the American military's commitment to constitutional order never wavered. Now that's not the case uh, in terms of what, what's happened over the years in many countries of the world where the military was involved in coups, takeovers of government and, 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 uh, and taking control of government in its own right as well. Number five, the rights and liberties of Americans were upheld and protect, protected. And number six here, I single out here further um, the rights of freedom of speech and especially freedom of the press in that the, the press has been under attack, especially in, in recent years. Number seven, I also single out the right to bear arms and its lawful regulation. And here, just think about and compare the laws regarding open carry of weapons in Washington, D.C., which you can't do it, where you can't do it, and with the laws of various American states, like in Michigan, where you can't. Number eight, in challenging actions and behavior of the Trump administration, officials in the executive agencies and bureaucracy, bureaucracies which had been referred to pejoratively as the deep state, quote unquote, acted in ways to uphold the count the accountability of government leaders to the American public. We saw this particularly in their testimony during congressional hearings, especially those bearing ultimately on the successful impeachment of President Donald Trump. And in the last week, we heard about the Justice Department officials refusing to go along with an appeal to the Supreme Court to overturn the election. Uh, though, though it would have been frivolous and hurt their reputations. And of course, former Attorney General William Barr and other Justice, Justice Department officials in the end came down in opposition to all of the president's strong efforts to upend the election results. Thus, American democracy is strong. Now, of course, there's a but, as, you, as some of you probably are thinking as well. But the election and its aftermath were stunning, frightening, and the nation must be vigilant. Now, I just offered the upbeat view regarding how American democracy and our political institutions have remained strong. But we should be alarmed about what happened in the 2020 election and in the past four years. The big question is, we can ask, will the state, of, will state and federal institutions hold up next time in the, face of, in the face of threats. And threats particularly like those threats um, that have occurred for Georgia, for state officials and leaders in Georgia, in which these Republican officials valiantly defied their parties. Uh, this is gonna be a um, continuing struggle. But, in, but in, 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 in terms of the things that were stunning in the election, first and foremost, we did not have a peaceful transition of power in 2021. 
This included obviously the attack on the US Capitol to interfere with the counting of electoral votes, which also threatened the lives of, of members of Congress and Vice President Michael Pence and led to the killing of uh, Capitol police officers and the death of a few of the um, insurgents. 20, 25,000, that's 25,000 National Guard troops plus other federal and local security forces were summoned to protect the inauguration on February 20th. And National Guard's troops are still in Washington. Moreover, is a little bit, and this is eyebrow raising, the FBI had to do background checks on Guard members to look for connections to potentially violent organizations. President Trump refused to concede and did not attend the, the inaugur inauguration as has been the tradition, tradition. And while he allowed the transition to occur and left President Biden a conciliatory letter, he never explicitly acknowledged that Biden won the election. Second, there were President Trump's many abuses of power. He behaved in an authoritarian fashion that has counterparts populist or otherwise in other countries today. This has already evoked the word fascist in some conversations. It raises the question of whether Trump's populism stretched American democracy to its limits and has opened a pathway potentially in the future toward authoritarianism. This raises a number of questions. Um, to what extent has it opened such a pathway? Is this reversible? To what extent is this, this path now open to future leaders? The fact that Trump did not prevail is beside the point. If this, is, this had involved a more skilled politician and a, different, and a different set of circumstances, the outcome of all this could have, been, could have played out very differently. In short, as some have argued, and for example here, PSQ board member Tim Fry, Trump was a weak, was a weak leader. For example, as some have argued, what if Trump had been more popular in terms of his popularity rating, which was low, it was below 50%, um, in contrast to stronger leaders who, ha who had much greater popularity in their country, like Putin and Erdogan in uh, Russia and Turkey, respectively. Had he been in a position like theirs, could he have gotten fully away with his abuses of power? I'm gonna leave it at that. But here's a list of the following abuses of power that were cited in, uh, they were cited by Marshall Cohen and posted online at CNN, and I've added a little bit to it. Uh, the abuses of power are subverting the 2020 election, or attempting to, inciting an insurrection, abusing the bully pulpit, politicizing the Justice Department, obstructing the Mueller investigation, abusing the, the, the pardon power, dangling pardons in front of people, the Ukraine affair and its cover up his desire for loyalty oaths and personalizing everything in government. Everything for him was transactional. Firing whistleblowers and truth tellers. And last, profiting off the presidency. His, his, his company continued, continued, his investments were maintained. Everything again was transactional. And also of course, Trump normalized nepotism and other aspects of corruption. Third, the nation is caught up in partisan politics on steroids. That's the way I like to refer to it, which led to the attack on the Capitol. And also, as we've seen in an unprecedented way, in an unprecedented way, the disagreements over that we've seen nationwide and over recent years about truth, facts, and reality. Leaders and voters now adhere now adhere to lies with immunity. Trump, it could be said, was held accountable for this in losing the election. But two thirds of Republicans in the mass public still think there was, a so there was solid evidence of fraud in the election. A great many Republican members of Col Congress challenged the electoral vote in key states after the attackers were driven from the Capitol on January 6th, just several hours after the, the, uh, the attack. Partisan politics today is highly emotional, personal, and it's even been called tribal. Each party and its supporters dislike the other. What has contributed to this is that the parties today, unlike in the 1950s, differ from each other um, 
on, on almost every important national issue. And at the same time, both parties are competitive for unified control of the federal, of the federal government. We've seen this more in, in recent years than, than, than prior to 1990. They now not only disagree on issues, but they also disagree on facts and reality that justify their disparate political opinions. We see this among political leaders in the debate over the election and also over how to deal with the pandemic. Democracy in America requires a level of what, what, I, what, I, what I refer to as democratic competence among both leaders and the public. Now, in the past, it's been the public that has been thought to fall short in terms of its capability and competence to learn about and understand issues and to, to learn about political, what, political, what political candidates stand for and so forth. In contrast, the elites, political leaders and others throughout the society and nation were thought to make, make up for this deficiency on the part of the, of the public and they could lead and educate the public. But now we have leaders who talk and act in ways that are, that are oblivious to facts, reality and science and do not hesitate to perpetuate these falsehoods. So elites now fall short as well regarding democratic competence. Not only is the public possibly vulnerable to criticism, criticism, criticisms of not being fully capable, but now we can level the same charges of elites on both sides. And in dealing, and in dealing with lies and speech that might incite, incite violence, there is conflict now about the bounds of free speech itself, especially regarding communication through social media and concerning the extent to which and also concerning the extent to which social media should be regulated, if at all, and how this should be done. And this has also re resurrected the debate as to what constitutes unlawful speech that incites violence. The question for American democracy here is whether the protection of free speech needs to be weakened. And I, and I can't quite believe I'm saying that. The article of, of impeachment against President Trump refers to inciting violence against the government of the United States. As Suzanne Nosel noted in a, um, a recent New York Times op-ed, the conviction on impeachment by the Senate does not require that the offense be a prosecutable crime, but it must meet the impeachable standard. Now the impeachable standard, as we know, is, is political, it's not legal. So that convicting President Trump uh, in the Senate based on what he said, what he said and what he did would not weaken technically the protection of free speech in a, in a legal prosecutorial sense. Okay, so that's the flip side argument about how the American system, well, has been shown to be strong thus far, but is perhaps in a precarious state. Okay, now I wanna close with comparisons to the Civil War and one lesson from it. So, we've, so I've talked about how democracy is intact and strong and I've talked about how it, and why it's more precarious than before. The level of conflict that, that, that has now produced this debate and led to an attack on the Capitol over the election uh, result has, I would argue, its closest comparison to the Civil War. Now, back then, as you know, the Republican and Democratic parties were so far at odds, you know, you know, partisan conflict on steroids like today, so to speak, that it led to the war with the highest number of American deaths, deaths about as many as all other U.S. wars combined. So the comparison with the, with the present, thankfully, only goes so far, at least so far. Although the issues of racial, racial justice tied to the war is also still front and center in American politics. Now in the 1960s, there was this old question often posed as a joke. And the question was, what's the biggest secret of the Civil War? The answer, it's still going on. Now there's one important lesson from the Civil War that deserves attention right now, in my opinion. It pertains to the importance of truth, facts, and reality. It, pertain, it pertains to the title of a song from the musical Hamilton. And it's a, it, it's, it's a, it, this, is a, this, is, this is a phrase that, that um, permeates the end of the musical. And there's also a song that's entitled, Who Lives, Who Dies, Who Tells Your Story? The story at issue in the musical was Alexander Hamilton's. His wife lived 50 years, 50 years after his death to tell his story. But for this talk, there's, an, there's, there, there's another case story in point 
um, with and, and with broader ramifications. And that was the his that's the history, the story of the Civil War, which I want to connect to the present. With the South's defeat in the war and the start of Reconstruction, and what followed thereafter in, in the 20th century, which was epitomized by the movie Birth of the Nation, the historical account that became dominant in the South about the Civil War was the Civil War as a lost cause, that, it, that was a just war and heroic, and not the treasonous insurrection that it in fact was. And that the Reconstruction imposed on the South by the quote unquote radical Republicans in Congress was unjust and hurt the lives of white Southerners. The Southern states did all they could to keep the memory of the war alive and to elevate the honor of its heroes and leaders in the war. And also justify what happened to blacks in the South with the end of reconstruction in, in the decades that followed with the Jim Crow laws, with lynchings and other travesties until the second reconstruction in the 1960s. Now here I refer, refer you to the work of historians, Eric Foner and David Blight. Part of the historical memory of the Civil War included the flags, the flags of the Confederate States, war monuments and reconcili reconciliation events every year with white Northern and Southern veterans celebrating and shaking hands. That's white veterans only. The South's assertion of its, of its version of history produced this kind of false equivalence regarding the war. I would argue, therefore, that how the history is written of the Trump presidency and the 2020 election is enormously important. There are, there are the makings of two diametrically opposed histories. The, the, one, the one to be told by Trump's Republican followers and the other more accurate history, I would argue, which ought to be the, the widely accepted one. How then do we tell the um, most accurate story for posterity? That, in my view, speaks to the importance of an investigation to hold President Trump accountable for what has happened since January 2017, culminating in the events of January 2021. This justifies his Senate trial on impeachment charges, whether he's acquitted or not. It looks like now he'll be he'll be acquitted, uh, which should have we should have a fuller public hearing of what happened to be recorded directly into the history books and on video. If needed, in, in addition to the impeachment, impeachment trial, there should be a nonpartisan commission to investigate the attack on the Capitol and the attempt to overturn the 2020 election with a fuller report to Congress and the historical and for the historical ref, record so that the story gets accurately told and remembered. And I'm happy, I'd be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Mariana, we have questions. Yes, we do. So thank you so much. Um, I think you've touched a lot on um, the questions that were submitted ahead of time, but we're going to go through those to start. Um, so these two kind of go hand in hand. What perils does our democracy face? And what reforms should and can be carried out to our political system, short, mid and long term? Well, that's that that that's that's a very big question, which we which we could wrestle with, you know, for 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 many, for many hours. I mean, the, the 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 biggest problem for the nation is is the lack of a kind of national unity that it had in the past. Now, ironically, it had it in the past because the political parties um, weren't, ideologically speaking, enormously different from each other. And there's there's a, there's a long story that we that we could talk about about that history, but in more recent years, the the, the parties have become um, ideologically very distinctive and elections have become more important because they tend to be close. And as I, as I said, and I said in the talk in passing, um, it, it becomes increasingly likely that, that one party can control both the presidency and the legislature and thereby the judiciary and thereby uh, promote its own ideological political agenda. So, so, the, so the stakes are enormous in terms of what the parties can do with unified government and, all, and also uh, they're competitive. They're very competitive, which, which has led to it really increase the emotional you know, level of politics. Now, the question is, well, what, what can be done to moderate that, that politics? And, my, and my, own, my own view of that is that it really has to, even, even though 
I talked about the democratic competence of the public and, the, and, and leaders, I think the burden here really, really does fall on, on leadership. And, and it, requ it requires a certain agency and initiative on, part, on a part of leaders that we, you know, that, that, that we don't really see. I mean, President Biden is trying to be a moderating force in politics, but it's a, it, 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 it's, it, it, it's, a, um, it's a pretty rough road. And the other thing that may, that may have been the major cause of all this, right, and needs to, needs to be taken into account at the, same, at the same time, is that people have lost faith in the capability of governments to deal with problems. And that has a chance of being resolved here if our government currently, albeit controlled by the Democrats, but to get anything done really requires bipartisan support. If government can act to deal with, with problems and, and uh, you know, we have a crisis in front of us, which would be very terrible to waste as Rahm Emanuel said, uh, it's an opportunity for government to show that it can deal with public problems. And the, and the big problems are the pandemic and the economy and it's the pandemic first and the economy next. Even conservative economists argue that, you, that we have to spend money to deal with the pandemic in order to deal with the economy and that requires, requires more money. And, uh, you know, that's the opportunity. Short of that, I don't. I don't. In terms of structural changes that could be made, those even if they even if there were ones that could be made, it would take a long time for those to, to have any effect. And you kind of touched on this a little bit uh, in terms of partisanship. Is our democracy headed toward a multi-party system rather than two, especially if the Republican Party continues to be the Trump Republican Party? Yeah, that, this, this, this is the big question. I mean, but both parties face, you know, are, you know, are facing tensions on that front. Um, the big question is, well, can the Republican Party hold itself together? That is the, 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 the Trumpist Republican Party and the old mainstream Republican Party. What's, what's going to happen to that? And then on the Democrat side, you have the moderate wing of the party and the, and the um, more progressive uh, wing of the party. And there, 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 there are tensions there, too. We're going to, we're going to, we're, we're, this is an opportunity to see what's going to happen. My bet would be that the part, the two parties will remain intact. I think the Republican party will probably figure out a way to unite in its opposition to the Biden administration. And, and the Democrats will have to wrestle with their, with their own internal struggles. But the political system is really set up in such a way that they're really impediments to, for third parties to form. If, if the Republican party were to split up, the end result would benefit the Democrats in the end. Um, because, because if, if, there were, if there was a three-party election, um, the, uh, the, the new party would siphon votes from the old Republican party and the Democrats would win the, with the presidential election. Also, in order, in order to have a third party, you know, and everybody seems to forget this, um, a party requires that the, organiz the new organization form run candidates at all levels of government. You just can't have a presidential third party. To have a real third party, it's, it's, gotta, it's gotta be everywhere. So when Trump talks about the Patriot Party, um, if he's talking about setting up a Patriot Party in, uh, you know, in, in, in multiple states and getting things going from the grassroots, that's, that's significant. On, on the other hand, if there, has, there really hasn't been talk of, um, um, about that. And of course, if the Republican Party did split, one, one, that, could, that could provide the impetus for some splitting within the Democratic Party. So there could, be, could, there could conceivably be four parties. But again, there, you know, we have to talk about is it, are, would these be four real parties running candidates at, at all levels of government? Mm -hmm. So I don't, I, I don't really, I don't see that happening. I see the Republican Party rallying, rallying together to, to oppose the Biden administration. It's like the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Okay. Mariana and Professor Shapiro, if I may step in to announce that we have one raised hand at this moment, maybe it's a good time to transition over to um, and engaging some of our members who are raising their hands. So um, again, this is a feature. We hope it's interactive and engaging um, for this uh, webinar today. Hello, Professor. I thought I heard you say that the uh, large turnout in 2020 was in spite of the COVID epidemic. I was of a mind that it was because of. And a follow-up to that question would be, um, what do you think the future of universal mail-in voting is um, state by state? Okay, that, that, now, that, 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 now that's a very astute comment. Um, on the one hand, my comment came from the, the, uh, the, the assumption that the pandemic would, would perhaps 
scare people, scare people off or make voting more complicated because people would have to figure out how to vote, vote by mail and so forth. On the other hand, um, one could argue, and, I, and I'm, I'm increasingly sympathetic to this, what happened with the controversy regarding the pandemic and mail-in voting, um, while, while some would argue that the Republicans were trying, you know, wanted to suppress the votes of, of Democrats. I would argue if there was any voter suppression at work or disincentive at work, it had a mobilizing effect. So I'm, so I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually very symp sympathetic uh, to your view. But the, but the one thing that happened is, is that these, um, the, 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 the pandemic voting might have, you know, mobilized the Democrats. But what also happened, and this, this, this needs to be appreciated, um, the Democrats won the presidency. They sort of won the battle. But in terms of the larger partisan war, what, what, what happened here was Donald Trump was, was able to mobilize 10 million additional voters from 2016 to 2020. So he expanded his, his base and thereby the base of the Republican, of the Republican Party. And so the, uh, the, the high turnout that occurred, I think it's a combination of the things you, that, that you emphasized, but it, but it also has to do with voter mobilization that occurred by, by Trump and, and also, of course, by the Democrats as well. And the Democratic Democrats mobilization um, had the effect of uh, keeping up with the Joneses, keeping up with the Republicans, and then and then going just enough beyond that to uh, to win the presidency and and to hold on to the Senate, especially with the with the, the, two, the two races in, in Georgia. Now, with regard to the future of mail-in voting, now this this is a great question because uh, and this is going to be a central question because now I'm expecting um, from the Republicans an increasing demand for their version of uh, election reform, which would somehow make uniform and consistent how states deal with mail-in ballots. Mm -hmm. And I think, and my sense, my sense is, I don't think it's, it's uh, too outrageous to expect that they, they may try to um, provide disincentives to try to, to try to less prohibit that to a, to a great extent where the Demo whereas the Democrats are, would be more open to that in terms of doing anything that would, that would make voting easier. So I think that's a, that's a contentious issue. I think it's an issue that's gotta be resolved because I think in, in elections going forward, we don't wanna be in a situation again where the, where the losing candidate can be a sore loser by complaining about vote fraud and voting irregularities. We need to do something to, to, to basically eliminate that question of voting irregularities. States that have had a history of, of mail-in voting have been very successful at it. They've done it for many years with, with no problem, including some Republican states such as, such as Utah. Thank you for the question. Two additional uh, members who are raising their hand. So if we may alternate at this time, uh, Marianne, if you would like to go with your next question. Sure. Um, the next question I think we could touch on, to what extent did Democrat, dem, nope, <laughs> to what extent did domestic extremism begin to erode our democratic institutions before the Trump presidency? Um, I, I don't. I, I don't. I don't think it, it, it um, eroded it. That is. When you, that, that is. You know, extremism, and we can talk about extremism on the right and extremism on the left. If it involves people, you know, peaceful protest, or even you know, peace, peace, peaceful protest that may turn into rock throwing and breaking windows and even breaking into you know, breaking into stores and, and causing you know, vandalism. Um, That, in a sense, is has you know is within a wide range of accepted norms of, of, in the United States in terms of things that have happened in the past and so forth. The the real eroding occurs when it begins to encroach on democratic processes and electoral processes in in the way that it did when the um, insurgents attacked the Capitol because they tried to interfere with the counting of the electoral vote, and that really is that really is you know something that that subvert, subverts the holding of free and fair elections. Um, if, if, if protests in the f past had led to voter suppression, I would say that would, that would have been a problem of the sort, but, but we really haven't had problems, problems like that. Um, or, well, arg arguably, there were problems like that back in the days of Reconstruction in the South, where, you know, where, where uh, after Reconstruction, Southern whites wanted to basically reasserted power there and they, they engaged in activity like that that subverted democracy in that way. But the, the kinds of protests that we saw, Black Lives Matter and the like 
are, are, are really substantively very different and are less threatening to democracy. And, 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 are, are, and, and also you know, even you know, that, that too, even demonstrations by the right of a parallel sort are certainly within in the bounds of normal, normal protest, even if they get a little out of hand in terms of violence. Thank you, we have a question, please uh, unmute yourself when you see the prompt. So my question to you is, uh, in view of the, uh, the election and the January 6th situation, how do you view American democracy in the light of other countries around the world, such as uh, those in the Middle East, Asia, and in Europe? Well, as, as, I, as, as I alluded to in, in the talk, I mean, the, Donald Trump se seems to be part and parcel of a, of a group of uh, uh, basically populist authoritarian leaders in, in different in, in in different parts of the world, and I think what's what's driving this, it, it, it's an interesting question in terms of what's what you know what what kinds of issues what is it what what is what is it that they have in common, and my, my own view of this is you know, especially in this modern day and age and, and in terms of progress of society, I think people have very uh, high expectations in terms of the quality of life they would like to have and the quality of government that they would like to have. And what's happened is that governments, governments have, have fallen short, especially with respect to people's high expectations. And I think that, that, and, that, that and, and, and disenchantment with current mainstream politicians, and the mainstreams obviously vary from, 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 from country to country. And Trump, Trump was part and parcel of this, of this kind of, of status, satisfaction, especially in the, United, in the United States, and this is common in other places too, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's especially among you know, working class citizens. And in, in the United States, we're talking, we're talking significantly about white working class voters who, who in the past had been loyal Democrats. And uh, they, they, they became disgruntled with the Democratic Party. And even when they shifted to the Republican Party, the, the, the Reagan Democrats became dissatisfied with mainstream Republican leaders. And, the, and, I'm, and I'm not an expert on comparative politics here, but what, what, you, what you want to look for, but what I would look for would be sort of similar analogous kinds of patterns in those countries. Um, and then also the emergence of a leader who can, uh, who comes across as a strong leader, becomes highly popular by taking positions on issues to favor these, these, this kind of working class oriented base, uh, a base that's disenchanted with how issues of inequality have been dealt with. <laughs> Uh, within the country, and in some of those countries, some of the, some of those some of those um, um, charismatic leaders have been able to garner uh, higher levels of support than Trump was. Trump has enormous had enormous support among his base, but but it was much more limited among independents and Democrats. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Um, so, a few of our members wanted to talk about misinformation as it relates. Uh, to representatives and government officials. Does the US not have laws and the will to hold elected persons accountable to their speech, action, and failure to their oath? And is there a way to develop um, for political parties to develop a way to adequately vet their candidates? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a very good question. The, the mechanism that we have to control these leaders is ultimately the ballot box. That's, that, that really is the fundamental one. Now, granted, with, in between elections, those leaders can do a certain amount of damage uh, based on what, they're, what, what they say and what, and what they do. In, ter in terms of other uh, ways, of, if, they, if, they, if they cross the line in terms of inciting violence, uh, you know, they, they, they could cross the line in terms of what, cross the bounds of free speech and be prosecuted you know, for that. If they, if they, if they begin ma um, basically making uh, untruthful claims about other political leaders, where, where, where you know, if, 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 if their claims about the whole conspiracy about the Democrats ba basically being uh, child molesters, so to speak. Um, one, one way of dealing with something like that would be to re relax libel and slander laws, which, some, which, ha which hasn't been talk talked about, but you find, but you, you find uh, more lax laws, more permissive laws to, to basically hold, to, you know, Basically, sue people or, or and take them to court because of of lies. But we don't have that um, in the United States. In terms of what the parties can do, now this is this is an irony here. The parties in the United States over time have become more democratic, with a little d. That is the way the, the way parties select 
candidates is through processes involving primary and caucus elections, where they've turned the, um, the selection of candidates over candidates themselves who want to run for, for office, if they can attract money and if they can attra attract supporters. Uh, so the party, the, the party leaders themselves have lo lost control of that process. The outcome of that process can produce candidates that do these, that are, are the kinds of candidates that are that, that, you're, you're que that the questioner is questioning here. And those candidates come about because they, because they can and because they can get public support. And that, that really points the finger at the public uh, in terms of its ability to be, to be duped and misled by candidates. And the question is, who do you blame the public or the, for being duped or do you blame, you blame the candidates for misleading and lying to the public? And I would argue you, you, you could blame both. But that's, but that's a product of having this democratized process. One solution, and there are a lot of critics who argue that we, we might want to go back a little bit toward in the direction of the old days where, where candidates were selected by um, credible, uh, respected, smart party leaders. Now, of course, if you do that, the criticism is, is that you've taken, you've taken the people out of the process. That is, you made the process um, less democratic and you know, you know, you know there, there are lots of dilemmas in democracy, and I would argue that that's one of them. Um, thank you. Please um, accept the prompt to unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Really, an excellent talk. I really enjoyed it. Wellington said at the Waterloo that it was a near run thing. I think that the election was a near run thing here, and that democracy dodged a bullet. My question to you is the following. <clears throat> in the next, the next challenge, the next couple of years, in my view, is what do we do about the fact that the Republicans have the majority of state uh, uh, legislatures now and they're gerrymandering? And also, what do we do about the 800-pound gorilla in the room, basically Facebook, um, Twitter, and all of the echo chambers in Fox News? How do we really deal with that? Because that's really fractionating our country. Your point about um, the states is, is very important. And when I, when, I, when, I refer, when I mentioned that, when I said that the Democrats won the battle of the presidency, but lost, but lost, but were losing the war, um, I was speaking to the fact that the Republicans picked up seats in the House of Representatives. They also held on to, held on to control of, of, of state governments, state legislatures, which, which will enable them to, uh, congressional districts drawn in such a way and congressional districts and then state legislative districts drawn in such a way to keep them keep them in power um, so that that the, so that control of the geography is important but part of the geographic problem for which there's no solution is that um, we get this configuration of Republican control because because Democratic voters tend to be clustered in big cities and the clustering in big cities is not is not a consequence of gerrymandering. It's a, it's a consequence of where people are choosing to live. And so so a lot of the ge geographic problem has to do with how people self-select in terms of you know, where they where, where they want to live. Um, also, keep in mind, uh, um, in terms of producing this problem and partisan conflict and all that, the Senate, the U.S. Senate is there's no, there's no gerrymandering there. And so, and we, we see parallel things going on there that are, that are, that, that, that are part and parcel of today's, today's conflict. And we see it today in the context, obviously, of the, uh, the debate about um, the impeachment. Now, with regard to you know, Fox News, information bubbles, and all, all those kinds of things, that's, that, 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 that's difficult because um, there are issues here of freedom of speech, freedom of the press. Um, one thing that led to media situation getting out of hand was that um, um, in, in the old days, the media was, there were, there were many, many fewer media outlets. Uh, at the time I was growing up, there were, there were lots of local newspapers, but, the, but with regard to national news, there were three networks, you know, three, three, three news channels. Uh, the news was on 15 minutes each night, then it was expanded, the national news, and then expanded to, expanded to a, a half hour. And then the way issues of co how partisan conflict was dealt with in those situations, uh, there, there was something called the fairness doctrine that, that existed, that, that if, if, if a media outlet took, allowed for partisan views, they had to give equal time to the, uh, to the opposition. And, uh, you know, so, so, one, so there, there have actually been proposals to bring back the uh, you know the fairness doctrine, but in, in today's wild west of media outlets, that would that would that that really becomes just very difficult and, and un, untenable. 
the, the re but but the reason that we have this um, partisan media environment, it, 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 it's bringing, it actually brings us back to the 19th century when we, there was a partisan press in the United States. And it, and it had to do with media markets. That is, Fox News could exist because it could, it, could, it, it could attract enough of a media market to make money. That is, it found its niche in terms of conservative news and conservative commentary and things, things of, those, of that sort. In, in, ter in, term, in terms of um, how to deal with this, this particular kind of situation without encroaching on, on, on freedom of the, of the press is, is really something that's, that's, that's very difficult. And, that, and then what you didn't mention, but that obviously contributes to that in a bigger way is, uh, is, is social media. And the debate about social media, is social media a, a, a me is it media or is, or is it more of a communication device like um, you know, uh, the, the telephone, so to speak? So I, I, don't, I don't really have a, a good answer there. The, in terms of solution, there and this is this is where leadership becomes important. Uh, it's pie in the sky, but basically it's the the owners of these news out, outlets and, polit and and well and political leaders. That is that is the, the the news outlets are picking up partisan conflict that exists. So if partisan conflict somehow became diminished because leaders behaved more like statesmen, uh, that would have to be covered by these media outlets. Now the media outlets, of course, could could, could focus on on conflict. The big bias in the press is. They're liberal and conservative news outlets, but the big bias in the press is one driven by economic concerns about attracting audiences. And basically conflict sells, and so the media focuses on conflict, and by focusing on conflict, it leads to, uh, it, well, it poses a problem for efforts to diminish that conflict. So I, I don't have a good answer for you. We'll um, be muting you at this time unless you have any follow-up. No, no, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think it's a good time to transition to the questions we've been getting during the session. Yes, please. So first one asks, as a longer term way to address division, what do you think about transitioning high school and college debate societies to conflict resolution and dialogue societies? I'm all in favor of that. Um, in terms, of, well, um, one solution that's been, well, one proposed solution deal with the current uh, information problem. If you, if you can't regulate the media, you know, the news providers and the media outlets, you've got to make consumers better consumers of information, more critical consumers of information, and to recognize the conflict that, that the media are uh, communicating and amplifying. And in terms of this education, you know, you, you could try to educate, educate adult, you know, adults and voters and all of that, but the way to start it over is to do something that will remedy the problem over the long term. And I would argue uh, what becomes very important here are new generations as they enter into, into uh, political and social life. And so what happens in the schools becomes more important. How do schools, you know, how do schools teach students, students how to deal with uh, information, the information environment, conspiracy theories, uh, social media, um, how, to, how to distinguish truth from lies, or, or at least how to compare um, views offered in, in different news outlets to, fit, to, to, to come to some conclusion about what actually is really happening. And, in, and with regard to conflict resolution to the extent that it emerges from that, the idea of having you know, activities in schools that promote uh, moderation of views, or at, least, or at least dialogue, just dialogue, just people talking to each other and listening to each other would be all for the good. So that proposal about uh, debate societies sounds all to the good for that reason. Okay, uh, so the next question, we may want to consider that the 2020 turnout was based on, quote, the house being on fire, not on a new and deep sense of civic duty and need for engagement. Would you care to comment on that? That, that's that's a, that's a very that's a very good question. I mean, you know, political scientists try try to study what factors you know, con contribute to voter the voter turnout, and the things that are, that become relevant are well, one, voters tend to be more likely to vote if they think the election's close, where they think their vote their vote might might matter, and 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 perhaps their vote in conjunction with their friends and family and others, you know, who have like like minded um, con kinds of views. In this particular election, I think people also got the sense that this this was an important election. People people really cared about care, care, you know, care, cared about voting, 
and 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 even though any one vote would have a limited effect on the outcome of elect of the election, since who who won or who lost would have such major consequences, even the infin infinitesimal contribution of their one vote, uh, people thought it was it was worth you know taking the effort to vote, following the election, and also spending you know long hours online, or kind of you know or or spending the time to request absentee ballots and figuring out how to fill them out correctly and um, and, and and drop them off. Uh, and then also there were efforts to mobilize voters by the parties. That is, people were out there asking, reminding people and asking people and pestering people to vote. That is, you know, mobilization was was occurring. So, uh, in, in, in terms of this instilling in people some civic mindedness that that in which they would automatically vote in next elections, I think that's up in the air. I think I think what's what's going to matter is to what extent people are mobilized because of their perception of the politics and how important it is for them to vote. And also the efforts that others make, parties and candidates make and local organizations make um, you know, to, mo to mobilize voters. And in this election, just to, you know, the, 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 the way I think about it in terms of uh, just summarizing it, the efforts of Stacey Abrams to mobilize voters and then the effort of the Trump campaign, uh, uh, their operation as well to mobilize voters. And I think those kinds of things have to be important. And I, and, and I think those things, those kinds of things are more important than depending on people to basically, you know, become overnight civic minded and will automatically vote in every election. I think it's going to be election by election. And actually, the next question kind of relates to um, that mobilization and the size of Trump's base. So how can one be optimistic with the size of Trump's base going forward? Um, well, it, it depends on being op, you know, optimistic about about what. I mean, if you're a, a Trump opponent, obviously that you know that that well that it poses a challenge. But you know, but that's the reality. The fact that 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 his base could increase, it shows you less his his power, I think, than the kinds of troubles that the people that that these voters see. And, are, and become mobilized to vote. It's, it's not so much Trump himself, but what, what, what Trump is trying to do in terms of going against the establishment, uh, making America first, dealing, um, dealing with immigration and uh, trade issues in a way that uh, makes America first, white America first, obviously when it comes to, to immigration and, and population uh, related issues. But, 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 but you know, but the fact that these people are mobilized it suggests that they're, you know, that they're interested in politics. They think it's important. There, there, there's, an, there's an upside to that, that as political scientists and others have lamented about, why is it that Americans don't vote? And now we're, we're, we're now, and now we have people, now we have some, some of us lamenting about, you know, stop voting. Why, why we don't want you to vote. That, you know, that, 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 kind, that kind of thing. But from the standpoint of the, of the Republican party, that mobilization was, was considered to be a, a, a good thing for the, for the party. Mm -hmm. uh, except that it, it's now led to a, a split in the party, uh, and the question is how how long will that will that kind of thing uh, last? But 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 the mobilization really really just shows, reiterates the kind of discontent there is out there, that is on the on the part of of uh, voters who are more sympathetic to what the Republicans and well what what the Trumpist party stands for. On the same side, there was the mobilization among Democrats, especially among minority voters and the like that Stacey Abrams was working on, which basically is an expression of that kind of oppositional discontent. Um, and now the question is, what do you do with this discontent on both sides? And another question that was submitted is also related to what you were just talking about. Why do the coastal democratic elites remain so ignorant of the Republican anger? Yeah, and, well, and and part of part of that being part of that elite, you know, part of that may be arrogance, thinking 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 we know better. But I think it's important for them to recognize that the, 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 these 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 voters ha have reasons for what they do. They're discontent with things that are happening, either happening in their own personal lives or what they see around them, what they see around them for the country. And um, that, that simply sends a message that lead, leaders need to deal with, with those particular uh, you know, kinds of problems. And, and the irony here is that you know, um, th those discontents in, the, in Trump's base are, 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 at least with respect to people in their everyday lives, with respect to the economy, with, res with respect to the future that people see for their children, they're all the same. Where they disagree are in certain, are in certain issue areas like immigration, uh, racial justice, you know, and 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 the like. 
but the, 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 they share a lot of discontents that have to do with the economy, uh, healthcare, and you would think in this pandemic there, there would there, there would be a, a, a you know, sort of a, a, a consensus on why that has to be a problem that that gets dealt with first and and, and foremost. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'd actually like to take the opportunity to go back to one of the pre-submitted questions. Um, how does Christian nationalism figure into the state of our democracy? Well, well, um, not quite. Well, if you mean by Christian nationalism, uh, a certain kind of religious conservatism that we might might associate with um, evan- evangelical Christianity among, uh, you know, um, uh, well, as part of the Republican base, and, and also even increasingly among, you know, certain segments of, of, of Latino voters um, in, in the United States. Um, if you're referring to that, that, that core of, 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 of the Republican and, and Trump base, it, it, it's significant. And for, the, for, the, for, the, for those people, issues like abortion and other social values issues, I mean, the, the you know, um, gay rights, but but now in, in the news today, obviously uh, tr- um, the, treat- the treatment of uh, uh, transsexuals in, in the United States, um, they they've beco- they've become a significant part of the of the Republican base, and um, you know, and and they 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 care they they care about it so much that not so much that it's led them to like Trump, but they but they but from their their point of view, uh, Trump is preferred or the Republicans are preferred because they immensely oppose and dislike the Democrats. And, uh, and that's significant. That's a significant, that's a significant part of the, of, of the Republican base and it's gotta be recognized as such. So back to our question. I know we're getting to the end of our time here but there's still a few more questions. Um, okay, so Pat Moynihan, Pat Moynihan said famously that people are entitled to their own opinions but not to their own facts. In the election appeals, judges have respected facts in the established sense, but Trump followers seem to be impervious to that. How do we restore the credibility of facts and in the institutions that discover and enforce them? Well, what's, what's, what, what, what's helped amplify and um, reinforce this misperception of facts among, among the public, among voters, is political leaders basically showing the same aver- aversion to facts. And uh, we, we, we can argue about that with respect to the outcome of the election. We can argue that with respect to, uh, to climate change. We can also argue it with respect to government policy toward the pandemic and the, you know, the, the use of masks, social distancing, and all those kinds of things. And I, and I would argue that the solution to that has to come from the top. That is, political leaders, you know, are are the ones that the, uh, the voters and the public are taking their cues from. And those, those cues have to be more, res- I think need to be more respectful of, the, of, of facts and reality. And we, we, we've just seen significant you know, deviations from them, which are, which are really astonishing, which are really astonishing. Um, all right. This- Okay, Woodward and Bernstein demonstrated exceptional investigative journalism with regards to Watergate and Nixon. Is there any hope that the current product sold as news or journalism is not the product of a free press, but just yelling from a soapbox to sell airtime, such as Rush Limbaugh? This phenomenon seems to be spreading globally. Would a better definition of a free press help? Well, um... The, the, the current problem, I mean, journalism today has, has, has great problems. And the problems are, are, are really even more extensive when it comes to uh, state journalism in states and localities. Um, the, 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 um, the number of newspapers in the United States has, has declined immensely. Um, people now are expecting information news for, news for free. Uh, the big question is who's, who's going to fund Who's going to fund investigative journalism? Uh, fortunately, we still have a lot of investigative journalism because some of the major news outlets still have reporters who, who are paid to do, to do that particular kind of thing. But there, there seem to be less resources out there, and especially when it comes to what's happening in, in, um, in, in towns and uh, localities. Um, 
there, 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 there's even more of a, more of a problem there. Uh, with respect to journalism, I mean, journalism needs sort of a new business model. Over my colleagues at the business school, at the journalism school at Columbia have been you know wrestling with this kind of thing. There have been reports done about how, how journalism needs to be supported by foundations or, or 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 in some fashion the government should be involved in helping sub, subsidize news outlets. Uh, that, that that's a um, that really really is a you know a, a significant problem. What was the other? There was another part of the question that I think I'm, I haven't touched on. Um, would a better definition of a free press help? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so. I mean, uh, well, it would a better def definition would help in the sense that it would have to be not only a press that was free to report on what it wanted to report on, but it would have to have the resources necessary to do that kind of thing. And so the, re the resource part would be, I, I think needs to, you know, in the past had been taken for granted because it was thought that, that, that there, were, there was enough of a market for the press that um, the money they could be make was sufficient to do the kind of work they needed to do. But nowadays the, the money seems to be uh, more difficult to get. So we're just past 6.15, should we still take a couple more questions? Yeah, let's take a couple more, yeah. Okay. Okay. Was this election more fueled by grievances rather than policy advocacy than other national elections in this century? Yeah, I, I, I would, I would have to, I would have to say that's that that's the case. Mm -hmm. I mean, one, 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 one could argue that dealing with the pandemic and the and the economic crisis um, was something that 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 should have engendered more substantive debates about, about policy. But with what's happened in recent years, you've, you've got elections that are, that are really fought on partisan grounds where the parties and the candidates have been basically um, relying on, on mobilizing their base of support. And the, base, the bases of the parties and the leaders really are at odds ideologically. And so, and, and the grievances are the grievances again, we're talking now about grievances against each other which can include grievances against the incumbent party in terms of what they've been doing in government. But, but here in, in, the, um, in the last election, the, the Democrats, Democrats had grievances against the Republicans, but the Republicans, even though they were in office, their supporters had grievances against the Democrats in the sense that they, they knew that there would be dire consequences for their own conservative positions if the Democrats took over the government, which they have. Okay, we have time for one or two more questions. Okay. Yeah, there's just a few left. Um, which system is more conducive to democratic institutional survival and growth, the parliamentary or presidential system, proportional representation or winner take all election system overall? And if you could go into the pros and cons of each. That's well. That that that, that that's a that's a question. That's a topic for an entire course in, in comparative in, in comparative politics. The um, um, it used to be thought by political scientists in the United States that a parliamentary system had advantages because in a, in a parliamentary system, the winner of the election controlled the government. That is, it, it, it controlled parliament and, 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 their, and, their, and, their, and therefore the, the executive, the, the, the prime minister could be, could be um, selected so that, you, so, so, that you would not, so that you would not have um, divided government. Uh, in 1950, there was a there was a political science. The American Political Science Association um, issued a um, a report toward a more responsible two party system, where it was suggested that the political parties in the United States should become more diverse politically, so that the voters would would, would, would get choices, and, uh, and 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 that parties could, could go in and out of power based on based on election results to institute their programs. Which would be different from each other, and then the voters would, would decide whether to accept or reject that at the, at the next election. Um, that was desirable from the from the standpoint of of, of basically producing a government could, that could deal with problems and also engage and engaging and engaging voters. So if you're talking about engaging voters, the part, uh, in that respect, there was a very that 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 fits the, the objective of having sort of a more democratic kind of um, kind kind of kind of system. A Multi-party system and proportional representation has virtue has the ver has has virtues of um, maintaining multiple parties so that voters would have choices 
of, of parties that had positions on issues more closely aligned with their own views. Rather than having only two parties to choose from, they would have multiple parties to choose from. Uh, that, but that, however, leads to a, a, um, a more stable system. Here, all I'm doing is, is just talking about the pros and cons of each. What it does force, though, for governments to form in a multi-party system, they, the parties have to engage with each other and compromise the form of, the form of government. And if that works out correctly, um, I, I would say in each of the three systems, if they, if they work out the way they're supposed to, they, they could probably produce comparably democratic outcomes, a, a comparable consensus. In the case of the multi-party system, you'd have a, a consen- sort of a consensus kind of government. In a, um, in, 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 in a, in a parliamentary system, you'd, 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 ha- you'd have the, a majority picking, you know, picking the government, and you'd have the same kind of thing in a, in a, in a presidential system, although you could have divided government in a presidential system. Mm-hmm. So again, I don't have I don't have a good answer to that question, but that's the usual kinds of pros and cons. In the current in the current situation in in the United States, um, the, the, and we're, we're going to see we're going to see it in New York in terms of voting systems. Uh, some people would, would argue that in um, um, uh, if you have first past the post kinds of elections, the way to produce more consensus candidates is to resort to things like ranked choice voting or approval voting. Where, 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 where the candidate who wins would be the candidate that could, that could uh, obtain the largest number, a majority of votes, um, a, ma- a clear majority of votes and a consensus based um, among voters, e- even though a lot of voters would not get their first choice candidate. Mm-hmm. Okay, one more question. One more, okay. Isn't it highly unlikely that a bipartisan group could agree on a history that is accurate considering the Republicans allegiance to the Trump version of events well that, that, that that's that's a that's a very good question the uh, if, if you if you look back on the Civil War history it it, 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 it took a great many years for, for for a battle to be fought about the uh, you know what, what the collective memory of the Civil War should be um, my assertion about the need to investigate this further and have have this reported, you know, reported fully for the history books. Um, on the one hand, makes a lot of sense to me. On the other hand, you could argue that that even after the history books get writ- written, there will be there will be disagreements and revisionists coming in to challenge that particular kind of kind of history. And I, 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 I and I I think there is you know you know um, um, we're talking about the the competition of ideas, and in the end, it really comes down to uh, leaders and the public being able to. Uh, acknowledge what's true and what's false based on um, objective reality out there. And I think there is an objective reality out there that people need to know about. And with that, I want, I'd, like to, I'd like to thank everyone for, for joining us um, this evening. And we'll, we'll be back in touch about future events and, all, and also check the, the Academy and Political Science Quarterly website for ongoing doings of the Academy and the journal, and also what's coming up next in terms of uh, events and panels. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.